lived in a five bedroom house, I had three cars, and just thought this is the American dream. A workaholic loses his job and wants to end it all. It all come crashing down on me. I didn't want to live life anymore. Until he hears a song. I was just bawling. I was so overwhelmed with just love. Plus, discover the art of rest in a world that never stops on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. We've got some great news. Our friend Pastor Robert Morris returned to his pulpit at Gateway Church last week. This is nearly two months after surviving a brush with death. Well, in early April, the Texas megachurch pastor suffered massive internal bleeding from two torn arteries. First responders couldn't find a pulse, so a helicopter life flighted him to a hospital in Dallas. His wife posted this video on social media pleading with people to pray. Word spread quickly, and it's estimated that over a quarter of a million people in 45 countries prayed for the beloved pastor. And he would need those prayers. Pastor Morris lost over half his blood. At one point, he said a final goodbye to his wife, then recorded a video for his children. And you can see friends and family lining the hospital hallways and praying as he went in for surgery. Well, Pastor Morris shared a conversation he had with God while he was facing death. As I thought about my family and the church and the ministry that God's given me, I just had this thought. And so I voiced it to the Lord in that helicopter. I said, Lord, I'm excited. I am so excited about coming home. I'm excited. But I would like to be there for my family a few more years. I'd like to be there for Debbie. I, I want to grow old with Debbie. I remember thinking that. And of course, some of you young people are thinking, y'all have already grown old. <laughs> but you'll get here too, smart aleck. Um, so I want to watch my children step into and fulfill the destiny God has for them. And I want to watch my children grow up, my grandchildren. I want to see my grandchildren grow up. And when I thought about the ministry God's given me, I said, and I just don't think you're finished with me yet on earth. I don't think you're finished with me. And the Lord said two words to me in the helicopter. When I said, I don't think you're finished with me, he said, I'm not. And I knew I wasn't dying that day. It's wonderful to hear that kind of testimony. One of the great blessings of the Bible, it always talks in terms of being able to see your children's children and talking about the righteous man being able to leave a legacy to his children's children. So congratulations, Pastor, that's wonderful. Well, at Betty and Bo's Coffee Shop in Wilmington, North Carolina, you can expect service with a smile and maybe a dance party. Well, one of their many special needs employees, Trevor, a.k.a. the Dance Machine, has a reputation for entertaining the customers. And as you can see, he's quite the dancer. Well, last week, the co-founder of Biddy and Bo's, Amy Wright, presented Trevor with a special award and a promotion. Take a look. You have joined us on a really special day because today we are surprising Trevor with something. You don't even know what I'm about to say to you, Trevor. It's gonna be a surprise for you. But you have been tearing up the dance floor for the past two and a half years at Biddy and Bo's Coffee. Yes. And every time you come to work, you come with such joy and enthusiasm and you welcome people and you dance, don't you? You love to dance and you entertain. And so I thought it was time to give you a promotion. We are naming you officially our Director of Entertainment. And with this comes a raise to Trevor. Way to go, Trevor. Way to go, Trevor. <laughs> the new director yeah. of entertainment. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and to raise requires a dance. <laughs> so yes, it there does. you go. <laughs> Looked like he was ready to break <laughs> he out right did. there. <laughs> well, we're thrilled to report another great word here that House Majority Whip Steve Scalise, Scalise was back on the baseball field last week. 
Fellow Republican Jeff Flake tweeted this photo with the caption, Steve Scalise is back on the field this morning. This does my heart good. Scalise tweeted back, feels good to be back with the team. And you know that's true. Yes, it is. And almost a year ago, Republican lawmakers were practicing for their annual charity baseball game, and then a gunman opened fire on them. Congressman Scalise was seriously wounded, nearly died. And CBN's Abigail Robertson talked with him about that faithful, fateful day and how a series of miracles and people's prayers kept him alive. When EMTs arrived, they quickly loaded Scalise into an ambulance headed for George Washington University Hospital. Given rush hour traffic, the ambulance hardly moved. Then, one EMT noticed a helicopter flying towards the baseball field. Even though they had no communication with the chopper, they made the call to turn around, hoping it was coming to pick up Scalise. And sure enough, the helicopter landed and it was there to pick me up. And four minutes later, I'm in the emergency room at MedStar Hospital. And uh, they said maybe one more minute and I wouldn't have made it. So uh, the fact that that happened, I would have died in the ambulance. I mean, there's no doubt about it. When Scalise reached the hospital, he had no blood pressure. Uh, and you talk to most doctors, they'll tell you, you're not gonna make it if you have a zero blood pressure when you arrive. Uh, they had to replenish my blood supply, literally putting more than two times the amount of blood that a human body has into me because I had so much internal bleeding. He lay unconscious for three days following the shooting before finally waking up. Even in the hospital, he faced danger after developing a life-threatening infection. They weren't sure whether I was gonna make it those first few days, but you know, finally I did and you know, thank God for the miracles and for the prayers all around the country, just the unbelievable, overwhelming uh, amount of prayers and support I got from people that I know and I don't know. And uh, I'm so thankful for that. Yeah, uh, we're thankful that he made it. It's, we need to pray for everyone in Congress, uh, the sacrifice that they go through uh, to, to represent us uh, and pray for all those in leadership. It's a, it's a terrible tragedy, but it, here we are a year later and he's back on the baseball field. That's, that's, a, good a, that's a good day. Absolutely. Well, a nine-year-old Virginia girl is inspiring people across the country with her impressive handwriting skills. Anaya Alec recently won first place in a national penmanship contest. As Charlene Aaron shows us, what makes Anya so amazing is she has no hands. Is 12, right? Anaya Ellick doesn't let anything stop her from doing the things she enjoys. I just like writing and cursing. And if I'm sad and I draw, it makes me feel happy. Born without hands, the third grader from Greenbrier Christian Academy uses her forearms to write. At a year old, her grandmother taught her to steady the pencil between her two wrists. Her mother says the family decided against the use of prosthesis. And they actually started to hinder her rather than help her. She didn't want them anymore. She had already started learning how to do th different things without them. She learned to write and draw without them. In a time with mainly computer keyboards and no emphasis on writing or spelling, teachers at the school say teaching students cursive writing is a vital part of their development. Research has shown that the part of the brain that does writing is closely related to children learning to read and to spell. Um, in doing cursive writing, they learn to look at the word as a whole. And so that is very important for their fluidity in reading and for them to be able to write words as a whole. School officials recently entered Anaya in a national cursive writing competition. Anaya's work went under a category for students with cognitive delays, intellectual, physical, or developmental disabilities, which was judged by a team of occupational therapists. Facing stiff competition and strict guidelines, the little girl with no hands came out on top. Teachers and contest organizers are absolutely amazed at the quality of Anaya's work. The people that judge the contest do it on the keys of legibility, which is the size, the shape, the slant, and the spacing of the letters, so they don't all scrunch in together. And when you look at her handwriting, it's just absolutely beautiful. To, to think that she can do that without any hands is very impressive. The biggest thing that Anaya has taught our class is that there's no excuses. Anaya has learned that at an early age because of the struggle she has had and the obstacles. She's learned, I can't do this yet, but I can figure out a way to do it or to come very close to doing it. And how does Anaya feel about taking home an even bigger trophy this year? I'm proud. 
Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Oh, way to go. Wow, uh, I and, guess yeah, so. That's not just teaching your class, that's teaching all of us. There aren't any excuses. Yeah. Uh, that's a wonderful She's thing. She's adorable. What a great can-do attitude. Something for all of us, as you said. Well, up next, a man on the brink of suicide. Here's a song. And I just remember thinking, man, this is my life. Haunted I ghostly lived in my See how a song by Big Daddy Weave helped to save a life. Don't go away. As the son of a prostitute, Sean Arvin had the deck stacked against him from the beginning. Still, he overcame an abusive background to achieve the American dream. But when he arrived at that place where he had everything he thought he ever wanted, he suddenly lost it all including a reason to live. Growing up, I used to lay in bed in the other room and hear men come in and have sex with her. Grew up with a lot of resentment in that. Sean Arvin's mother was a prostitute and he never knew his real father. When you're in that environment and you're around drugs, there was physical abuse, mental abuse, and actually sexual abuse. First time I was uh, raped, I was uh, eight years old. As a kid, you, you have no idea emotionally what you're going through. I had no idea what any of that stuff really meant. It's not something that any kid should go through. Because of his mother's lifestyle, Sean was forced to move frequently and grow up fast. Sometimes I would be with people I don't even know. My mom would just take me there and drop me off and I'd be there for a few weeks. So I learned how to survive and uh, surviving meant hustling. So by the age of 10, man, I was already out working. After high school, Sean got married and joined the Army. He continued to survive by hustling and working three jobs on the side to provide for his wife and two sons. Just thought life was about work. Making money and bigger house, bigger car. But things just didn't work out. A lot of it had to do with just from my past and uh, me not even knowing who I was or not even knowing uh, anything about life. After his divorce and discharge from the Army, Sean dove headfirst into the party scene. Found a lot of love. Man, when you're, when you're buying cocaine and you're buying drinks at a bar and you're hanging out, trust me, there's a lot of people who say they love you, but man, that ain't, that's not real love. He went back to school to get a degree in business and an MBA. He threw himself into a career with equal intensity. Work is, is just as much of a, a false love as heroin addiction, including going to school your whole life, including um, working 80 hours a week. Sean continued to work long hours and finally landed his dream job. I had life whooped by a tail. Um, lived in a five bedroom house, I had three cars, just thought, this is the American dream. One day, a new boss came in, and he let me go. It all come crashing down on me. And I just sat there, and I just thought about my past, and thought about me, and just thought about I didn't want to live life anymore, and I just thought about my sons. And I thought, man, they'd probably be better off if they didn't have a dad who hurt them like I had been hurt my whole life. Sean planned his suicide, but before he could carry it out, a friend who knew he was struggling invited him to visit. Sean flew from his home in Kentucky to Florida. While there, he met a homeless man in a park. We just hung out that day just talking about everything. I mean, you name it, kids, life, you name it. And he said, hey, Sean, and I stopped and just turned around and looked at him and he said, hey, man, I just want you to know God loves you. And I just thought, what? In my mind, I was really thinking, who is this guy to be telling me about God? Over the course of the next 10 days, Sean had a series of similar encounters, each person offering the same message of God's love for him. Before Sean flew back home, his friend gave him a copy of the Big Daddy Weave song, Redeemed. Seems like all I could see was the struggle. 
And I just remember thinking, man, this is my life. Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past. When he returned to Kentucky, he saw an ad for a Christian concert in the area. The headliner was Big Daddy Weave. Sean bought tickets to the show. Right after the concert gets over, Jay Weaver, the bass player for Big Day Weave, comes off stage and he's just like, God wanted me to come down here and tell you, man, if you'll let go of all that stuff, man, he's going to set you free. And man, he's going to use your life for big things. He's going to do miraculous things. And you're going to touch thousands of people with your life if you'll just let go of all that stuff from the past. And man, I was just bawling. I was so overwhelmed with just love. I just felt like for the first time in my life that I was loved. Sean felt compelled to go to church the following morning. Every single word the preacher is talking about is about me. I do remember him saying, if anybody wants to come up front, I, and before he could even get that out, I was already in his face. And I was like, let's do this. I'm going to give myself to Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. That's what I'm going to do. Wherever he wants to go, whatever he wants to do, wherever he wants me to be, that's what I'm going to do, is I'm going to do Jesus the rest of my life. He was later able to forgive his mother and others from his past and leave his drug and work addictions behind. One weekend, I sat at home in a notebook. I just started writing. Every person who had hurt me just prayed and kept saying, God, please forgive me for holding on to this, and God, will you please forgive them? And by the end of Sunday, I felt like I was free. Today he is married and he and his wife, Inga, run a community center in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Louisville. Through his ministry, Love City, Sean has a vision to redeem his community one life at a time, just as God has redeemed his. You know, our motto is real simple. Just love God, love people. Mm, let him figure out the rest. If you ever get a dose of Jesus' love, Man, God, it's purest love, and you get it, and there's no greater high. Boy, I just think as I watch Sean's story, the one that the sun sets free is free indeed. And his message is for all of us, but especially for you today, if you haven't experienced the love of God in your life, or maybe you're, maybe you're being beaten up by your past, by things that have happened that have chained you. Well, today you can let go of that. Today you can say, Jesus, I'm giving my life to you. I want to be set free. I want you to forgive me and help me to forgive those that have touched me and wounded me inappropriately, that have left me with scars, with anger, with frustration, with a lack of understanding. Today I'm coming home to the Father heart of God. I want all of who you are, all of what you want to do in me, all of what you're willing to do through me. I say yes to you today, God. That's the prayer. It's really a conversation with the one who created you. He's been waiting for you all this time. Ask him to come into your heart and life. Ask him to set you free. Ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit so that everything in you, everything about you, lines up with his perfect will. You will find all that you're looking for there. You know, if you're empty today, like Sean was empty, you keep trying to stuff things into your life, people, jobs, money, whatever it is that you think is going to make you happy, and you keep coming up short. It's because there's only one person who can fill that emptiness, and it's your Creator. It's your Savior, Jesus Christ. Ask Him to come into your heart today. If you have a specific need in your life, if you're dealing with addiction, if you've got issues that you need prayer, our prayer line's always open. It's 1-800-700-7000. But today, be set free indeed by the only one who can do that for you. Gordon? Well, still ahead, are you stressed out, burned out, or just plain exhausted? You might be in desperate need of a Sabbath rest. Adam Mabry offers a crash course on applying grace to your calendar, inbox, and work. Stay with us. As a successful pastor of a growing church in Boston, Adam Mabry looked like he had it all together, but his family knew better. Their dad was exhausted physically, dry spiritually, and depressed emotionally. 
Today, he's learned a better way. Take a look. Many people are driven to be successful and feel productive when checking off their to-do list. Adam Mabry was one of those people. As a self-proclaimed achievement nut, he nearly worked himself into an early grave. People like you and me feel like we'll miss out on career opportunities or goals if we stop. But the tragic irony is we will miss out on much more if we don't. In his book, The Art of Rest, Adam exposes the common enemies of rest and shares why he made a drastic change to his life for the better. Well, Adam Avery joins me now, and thanks for being here. Yeah, pleasure. How bad did it get for you? Were you having, like, physical symptoms of exhaustion? Yeah, I, I mean, exhaustion wasn't so much it. It was the emotional side and the spiritual side. Um, uh, because, yeah, as I mentioned in the book, I'm a, I'm a doer, and uh, the Lord lovingly brought me into a season where I couldn't achieve my way out of it, and I had to learn how to stop. And so, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was, it was physically exhausting, but more, more so emotionally. I used to think um, that folks who struggled with anxiety or depression just maybe just needed to cheer up, and uh, <laughs> just terribly small-minded, <laughs> um, until, until I met that own, my own uh, season of, uh -huh. of real darkness, and the Lord really showed me how, how resting and being with Him was the only way out. Uh, how did He do that? You know, it, yeah. it's, I, I think people at home watching say, okay, the Lord showed you. Okay, how? Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the first way was by making me pay attention. So, so really leading me into a situation that, that I could not get out of. I mean, I know we like to think that God always wants to bless us and just shower us with goodness. And that's true, but it's not the whole truth. Uh, it, because to get us to the place where we can receive it, it, to get me to the place where I could receive it, he had to break me, and that was not a pleasant process. And so we had a child that wouldn't sleep, a church that was exploding, a degree I had to finish, and a, and a fixer-upper of a house that I was just per remodeling with my bare hands. And uh, man, at some point I was like, man, I, I hate all of this, and I just wanted to, to drop all of it, and um, went into a really dark spot. And, and so getting there was the beginning of getting a new perspective on how to, how to work really hard, but for my work not to be the thing that defines me. Mm -hmm. Um, Jesus said something interesting about entering into his rest as if he owns that. Yeah. And there's the implication that there, there are people that don't enter into his rest. Mm. Um, wh what, what have you found is that? Yeah, so he says that he's the Lord of Sabbath. So what's fascinating about that is we tend to think uh, as, as good Christian folk that, that Sabbath is this set of things that we must do. And so uh, I, I've had so many conversations with uh, people just in my own church. Hey, I don't have time to read the book, but just give, give me the, you know, the quick you know, five ways to Sabbath. And I'm like, yeah, that's the problem right there, right, <laughs> right there. Because Jesus is the one who is at rest. I mean, if, if you think about our gospel, it's the story of God who needs nothing from us, coming and doing everything for us so that he can, can have a relationship with us, which sounds crazy, uh, and it kind of is, except that that's the kind of God that he is. And so when we come into relationship with him, and, and he does have things for us to do, it's not as it was before. It's not we do these things so that we can become something. It's we do these things because now he's become everything for us. And so entering into the rest of Jesus means living in his way. Jesus was never stressed out. That's crazy sounding to me because he literally had the weight of the world on his shoulders. I mean, his job yeah. saved the world. Like you'd think he would have gotten after that at like 18 or 22. And he, he works a job for 30 years. And then even for the three years of ministry that the scriptures record, he's peaceful and he takes time to be with his father. And he, you know, he'll be with the big crowds and then he'll go be on his own and he'll send his disciples ahead of him. And that's, that's an amazing way for our savior to have lived when he had so much to get done. So he's the one who got more done than any of us ever will, with more peace than any of us yeah. ever walk in. He really didn't travel very far. No. He, you know, shuttled back between Galilee and Jerusalem a mm -hmm. couple times, but um, he, he accomplished a great deal. Right. Which has to say something about how rest creates space even for those relationships um, to, that, that will, in fact, change the world to grow. We tend to think that the way to change the world is to get is maybe for, for one's platform or one's work to have a long spread. But Jesus saw the long game of, I'm going to invest in these 12 men and I'm going to pour my life out before them and I'm going to let them get close enough to me to know who I really am. 
and Christianity took over the Roman Empire, you know, a century later. That's, that's a fascinating thing to think about. No one else in history has done anything like that. All right. Um, why is it so hard for us to accept that, that rest is, is not a do but a be? And we, we tend to want to, you know, let's, what's the checklist and what are the rules that I have mm. to observe and, and how, how do I do rest? Mm. Uh, why is that? Because it's the world we live in. There's no thing in this world that we achieve without getting really, really busy to work hard to do it. And so when a pastor like me says, hey, you should learn the art of rest, then we just think, oh, I need to add 10 more things to my to-do list so that I can also do that well. Um, because the, the world system in which we live is one of you, you work really hard and then you get stuff. The kingdom of God is not arranged in exactly that same way. And so for those of us who've been born again into God's new world, it's a whole new way of living and a whole new way of experiencing what that future heavenly world will be like, even as it comes to earth one day. And so it, it's just different. And, and recognizing that means that we've got to allow the gospel to shape the whole way we live, not just personal morality or perhaps how we think about rearing children or what we do on Sunday, but like the entire way we approach the relationship of work and rest is transformed by the gospel. How's it working for you now? You still a yeah. doer? Oh, oh, totally. Yeah. I'm on like my sixth graduate degree or something. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still <laughs> remodeling my house and I know I'm, I'm still totally an achiever, but um, I'm learning to stop. All right. Well, the book is called The Art of Rest, and it's available wherever books are sold. Here's a word for you from Matthew. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. God bless you. We'll see you again.